Daniel and the Good Evening Brethren Sisters and Young People. Pretty obvious in that reading of Genesis 48 that the issue there is firstborn, isn't it? And so it is at the beginning of Genesis 49. So I want to start this session this evening, which predominantly is going to be about the blessing of Jacob on Judah. We want to start it by having a quick look at the blessing of Joseph's sons. This is a little package, this area, Genesis 48 and 49. And it's just one of those fascinating facts that in the record that we have before us of the last words of Jacob, the name Jacob occurs seven times. But the name Israel occurs 14 times. So you see the, the real Jacob. And of course, Jacob we know means heel catcher. When he was born, he was born with his hand upon Esau's heel. And God had to spend 147 years to release his hand from Esau's heel. But he finally succeeded. And Jacob tells us how here in Genesis 48, when he, speak, he blesses Joseph in verse 15 and says, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. He tells us why God was able successfully, in the end, to take his hand off Esau's heel. So what we have here... Uh, in these last words of Jacob is in fact the, the emergence of Israel. Now we know that's the spiritual name. Israel means to prevail with God. So finally, finally Jacob has prevailed with God because God has been working in his life. And it's a very long process, isn't it, to get to that stage. In Jacob's case, a long, few and evil process, he said. My days are few and evil. 147 years it took. It will take a bit less in our case. You can be assured of that. So let's have a look then briefly at the blessing of Joseph's sons. And there's some very curious things here. The reason I'm doing this is because this is the third place in Genesis where we have the allegory that speaks of the Mosaic covenant and those living under law and the Abrahamic covenant and those living under grace by faith. That's what we find here again in Genesis 48. Three times in the book of Genesis. So let's have a look at verse 1. Genesis 48. I want you to notice the way that the language is couched here. It reads in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, that is the order of their birth. Just step back with me to chapter 41. And let's just pick this up in the type, because we know this is a type. We know that chapter 41 of Genesis is about the resurrection of Christ, his exaltation to the right hand of God. That's what it's about. But he has, of course, two sons. We read of those in verse 50 to 52 of Genesis 41. It says in verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. Now, those of you who understand the types of the, of the life of Joseph know that the second advent of Christ is typed from verse 8 onwards of chapter 42. Alright, so we're not too far away from chapter 42 verse 8 when the type turns to the second advent of Christ and the Jewish recognition of Jesus as Christ. Okay, So, what happens prior to that between the exaltation of Christ to the right hand of God which is symbolised or typed in his exaltation to be the second power in Egypt and his return to redeem Israel. What happens? Well, it says in verse 50 of chapter 41, the two sons were born unto him before the years of famine came. Well, what do you think the years of famine are in the type? That's the dark ages. That's that long period when the truth was almost snuffed out. It flickered here and there maybe, but... It's the Dark Age period. So what we are being told in the type, that our Lord Jesus Christ has a relationship to two sons, so to speak. And they are called Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 51 says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Now Manasseh happens to mean causing to forget. And Jeremiah speaks on behalf of Yahweh. 
Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 32 we read, My people have forgotten me days without number. That was their characteristic. They were like Manasseh. But then there's another son who comes on the scene. Verse 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me, he said, to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Ephraim means fruitful or double fruit. Double fruit gained in the land of affliction. And Ephraim represents spiritual Israel. So whereas Manasseh represents natural Israel, Jews living under law, who forgot their God frequently, Ephraim represents you and me, brothers and sisters, the true ecclesia, consisting of faithful Jew and Gentile. So you need to have that in mind when you come to Genesis chapter 48. For Jacob's greatest act of faith. So before we go to chapter 48, I want you to come, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's just see where this sits in the scheme of things. Now you and I wouldn't have declared this, chapter 48 of Genesis, to be Jacob's greatest act of faith, but God does. So there's got to be a good reason for that. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21. And there we read, By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Now in actual fact, that's how chapter 47 of Genesis ends. Not in the AV, and in other translations, <coughs> especially of course the Septuagint. But you see, what Paul's telling us is that when Jacob crossed his arms to bless the two boys, the younger before the elder, it was his greatest act of faith, the one that was going to go into the record of Hebrews 11. Would you put it there? No, probably not. So why? So let's come back and have a look and see why. Genesis chapter 47 and verse 31, in the last sentence of that verse it says, Jacob, uh, uh, and he swear unto him, that is Joseph swear unto Jacob, and Israel that's the spiritual name, bowed himself, in other words he's worshipping, it says his bed's head, they didn't used to have beds like we have beds in those days. The Septuagint renders it staff, and we're told in Hebrews 11 that it was his staff, so he's leaning, and just bear this in mind, he's leaning upon his staff, where do you reckon the staff was? Well what's between his knees? And I think I read in Genesis 49 that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver, and we're going to find that that's a staff, a staff from between his knees. Alright, we're going to see that when we get to Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. But that's a little way down the track. Now read, read with me Genesis 48 verse 2. And one told Jacob, and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh to thee. Notice how it switches. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, <coughs> listen to these words, God Almighty appeared unto me at last. He's going right back to Genesis 28, to Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people. Now there are three different Hebrew words translated multitude in this chapter. We're going to point them out as we proceed. This word here is Quahal. It's the Old Testament equivalent of Ecclesia. I'm going to read it that way. This is what Jacob is saying to Joseph when he brings his two boys. God said to him, I will multiply thee, and I will make of thee an Ecclesia of people. And I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Now, Joseph should have picked up on the hint that is being dropped here by Jacob, but he doesn't. In fact, we're going to find Joseph's a bit slow in this chapter. He's a bit slow to pick up. Jacob is a whole lot further down the track than Joseph here in Genesis 48, as we're going to see. Joseph doesn't get it. But read verse 5. Now bear this in mind. Put yourself in this room. 
You've got Jacob, the old man, about to die. You've got Joseph, he's got two boys. They're not really boys, they're over 20. Probably Manasseh is 21, 22, and Ephraim's about 20. So they're over 20, so they're not boys. So when it says down, you notice there it says in verse 12 of Genesis 48, that Joseph brought them out from between his knees. It sounds like they're grandchildren, you know, they're little toddlers. No, no, no. They're over 20 years of age. So this is not little children that we're dealing with here. Grown men. So when we read in verse 5 these words, and this is Jacob talking, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. I mean, we're not told what Joseph thought about that. I don't think he would have thought, well, Dad's senile. He doesn't know the order in which his grandchildren were born. He wouldn't have said that. He's got too much respect for his father for that. But, you know, would he ask the Dad, why did you put Ephraim before Manasseh? I mean, Manasseh's the older. He should have picked up on what Jacob was doing. And Jacob is very, very precise. This is his greatest act of faith, brothers and sisters. He knows exactly what he's doing. And later on in this chapter, when Joseph tries to take his hand and pull it off, Ephraim's head, he says, Leave me alone! I know what I'm doing. So you see, it is an act of faith. He's absolutely pristine in his thinking. He knows what he's doing. So let's read on. We don't have to read all this, we just read it. That was one of the reasons for doing so. So the record would become familiar to us. So we don't have to go through the detail. But what happens here, when we get down to verse 13, is that the blessing of Joseph's sons begins. Now Joseph choreographs the situation. He's got it all worked out. You know, in those days, to put the younger before the elder was a big deal. It's not so much of a big deal today, is it? But in those days, you did not put the younger before the elder. The position of the firstborn was respected and honoured, and it was a position you didn't mess around with. So you see, that's why Joseph choreographs it in verse 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand. So why? Well, you see, in the scripture, the right hand is always used as the hand of authority and power. And the left hand is always used of weakness. Human, mortal weakness. So you've got to have the right hand. If you're the firstborn and you're going to be blessed, you've got to be in the right hand, not the left hand. That's the lower hand. Okay? So Joseph brings, he brings Ephraim, the younger, at his right, so that Ephraim is going to be at Jacob's left. And he puts, of course, the older boy at Joseph's left, so when he gets to his father, Manasseh is at Jacob's right hand, the hand of power and authority. But it doesn't come out that way, does it? Look what happens in verse 14. And Israel... Now, remember this, this man is days away from being put in a box. He's nearly dead. So this is a bit of an effort. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head. And then he crosses the other hand over his left hand and put it on Manasseh's head. And Joseph says, what are you doing? What's that about? Well, it's very, very important, as we're going to see. And the record goes on to tell us about Joseph's displeasure. Verse 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head. And to Manasseh's head. You, know, you get the picture. It's this old man with his hands crossed over like this on two boys' heads. And Joseph grabs hold of his head. No, Dad. This hand here. This has got to go over here. Leave me alone. Verse 18. 
Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. And just in case you didn't get the point, he says it again. I know it. He also shall become a people. In other words, Manasseh. Manasseh, the older boy, he shall become a people, yes. Yeah, the line of Pharis would be blessed, and Israel would develop out of it, have their kings, David and Solomon, and lead down to Christ. Yes. It would be great. But his younger brother will be greater than him. Why? Well, he's already told us. He's already told us back in verse 4. We read there, I will make of thee an ecclesia of peoples, plural. And we read at the end of verse 19 these words. For truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now where have you heard that before? I will make thee a father of a multitude of nations. That's the Abrahamic promises, isn't it? That word multitudes there is the word mellow. It means actually, as your margin suggests, fullness. In other words, it's not just going to be one people. It's going to be many peoples. Gentiles drawn to the truth through the Abrahamic covenants. That's how this ecclesia of verse 4 is going to be developed. The hope of Israel is going to be, The red corn people are going to pour in. You see, Ephraim represents spiritual Israel. Through the Abrahamic covenant. That's why his name means double fruit. Yes, fruit from Jew and fruit from Gentile. Joseph was slow to pick up on that, but that's exactly what Jacob was on about. You know, it's a fascinating thing. But the other place where the word multitudes occurs is back in verse 16, where it says, And the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow... Talk about both of Joseph's sons. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And that's a Hebrew word, rob, which is actually spelled R-O-B. It means something like what the margin says in your Bible. As fishes do increase. Fishes? Yeah. That Hebrew word just happens to occur 100 and 53 times in the Old Testament and I don't need to remind you of John chapter 21 and verse 11 do I? John 21 verse 11 says that when the net, the third net which doesn't break because it's about getting people into the kingdom in immortality that net contained 153 great fish. Got a picture? Got a picture of where Jacob's mind was? Yes. A man of great faith. Not only a man of great faith, but a man of great perception as well. And that's why he gets into Hebrews 11 with this act of faith. It says in verse 20 of Genesis 48, And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless saying, God make thee as... Look who comes first. Ephraim and Manasseh. Yes, so you've got spiritual Israel in Ephraim, you've got natural Israel in Manasseh. And that's why it then adds, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. By the way, the boys' names are used eight times in this chapter. And eight just happens to be the number of immortality. That's what the aim of this is. To bring people into that great net. Fishes. The number of the sons of God. So we come then to have a look at Jacob's blessing on Judah. And we had a look briefly at the early verses of Genesis 49. So we don't need to go back and to do too much on them. But let me just introduce the blessing of Jacob on Judah with the words of Brother Thomas from Elpis Israel, page 281. And this is what he wrote. 
The blessing on Judah contains in it the hope of Israel. It shows what views Jacob had of the promises made to him and his fathers. His faith was of things substantial and definable. He looked for a kingdom and an empire whose royal domain should be the land of Canaan and especially that part of it allotted to Judah and whose imperial ruler should be the giver of peace descended from his loins in the line of Judah. The Spirit of God in Jacob marked him out to wield the scepter and to give laws to the world possessing the gate of his enemies and blessing all the nations of the earth. That's how Brother Thomas introduces his exposition of this portion of Jacob's prophecies of the last days concerning Judah. Let's then have a look at Genesis 49 and verse 8. Judah. Now you all know, of course, that Judah means praise, especially praise to Yahweh. So there's a play on the name here, isn't there? Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. So is this meant to be praise to Judah the man that we've been considering? Well, of course, there would have been a degree of praise given to Judah because of what Jacob says about him, because of his conversion, because of his effective leadership, because of his reforming abilities. Yes, there was a degree of praise, but it's not actually about him. It's not about him. The prophecies of Jacob are about the work of God in Christ. And Christ is everywhere evident in the prophecies of Jacob. And he's certainly evident here. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, is pointing to the time when our Lord Jesus Christ shall rule on David's throne. Now later on I'm going to take you to the obvious passage that you could probably go to now. Revelation chapter 5 where we read about the lion of the tribe of Judah. We'll reserve that until a little bit later. Because we're going to come to the lion in verse 9, shortly. But it goes on to say in verse 8, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Now that phraseology is used in Psalm 18 and verse 40 of David subduing his enemies. And Psalm 18 just happens to be an Armageddon psalm. So that's how this blessing of Judah begins. It's about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who will come to establish the kingdom of God, to bring divine judgments to the earth. And the effect of that is, at the end of verse 8, thy father's children <laughs> shall bow down before thee. I thought that was going to happen to Joseph that his brethren would fall down before him. Well, of course, we know, don't we, that the dreams of Joseph were also about our Lord Jesus Christ. We all will bow before him. And so it will be. It was foreshadowed in Genesis 37 in the dreams of Joseph. And all Israel will one day bow down to Christ as prince in Judah. Now, we could go to a multitude of references about that, but we don't need to, because we all know that that is going to be the case. So let's move to verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. And we'll stop there, because you see, this verse actually contains information about the beginnings of the conflict at Armageddon and then the end of 40 years post-Armageddon, conflict that brings the subjugation of the nations. It's all there in this verse. Squeezed into one verse. So what's this lion's whelp that's referred to here? Well, the word whelp, the Hebrew word, actually means a cub or a whelp or a, or a young lion. And of course this is talking about a lion beginning his career. So he's going out and he's developing into full strength. And there's a ferocity as he goes about in search of his prey. We can actually read about this lion of the tribe of Judah later on in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. But then it says, 
From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. So this, this phrase, from the prey, is actually talking about the grown lion, lion who has caught and consumed his prey. So he's going up from the prey. So he's caught it, he's consumed it, and now he's going up to find a resting place. So he will not always tear and rend. The work of Christ, in the scheme of things, will seem quite brief, even though, of course, it is going to last for a period of 40 years. But 40 years, in relation to eternity, is quite brief. So he will go up from the prey, and he will rest. So the aftermath of Christ's triumph over the nations will see a recognition of this one as the Son of God. That's why you see in the prophecy it says, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. And this is the word Ben. This is about the family builder of the divine family. He's going to build God's family on the back of the judgments that will be played out from the time of Armageddon. But a time of rest is going to come. And it says in the middle of verse 9, he stooped down. Yeah. So he's going to rest. There will be peace. And he couched as a lion. The word in the Hebrew, rabat, means to lie down, to recline. So the time of peace has come. But then there's a little addition here, a most unusual addition. Because it then says, and as an old lion, and this is the word, Libya in the Hebrew, which actually is a feminine word and refers to a lioness. So the revised version, for example, says, as a lioness. Now we know what lionesses do. They do the, the hard yards, you might say, uh, in the wild. They're the ones who go out and usually catch the prey. And then the old lion, the male, comes along and says, thank you very much, I'll chew on that first. But you see, the mother lion, the, the lion that has responsibility for the cubs, she's the one that does most of the hard work. She is fierce also in protecting her offspring, as Christ will be fierce in protecting his offspring. He will protect Israel from the oppressor, or at least save them from the oppressor. He will protect his people, as the lioness does. So the lion of the tribe of Judah has a work to do. And it's all set out there in verse 9. But it goes on to say at the end of that verse, Who shall rouse him up? Or as the RSV puts it, Who dares rouse him up? None will challenge the rule of Christ once all nations have been subdued under his feet. Now this is repeated by Balaam. Let's come to Numbers 24, and we'll see that Balaam's prophecy also picks up this language from the prophecy of Jacob. Numbers 24, we're in the third parable of Balaam, when we begin to read from verse 7. And the third parable of Balaam is all about Israel's kingdom being exalted over Gog. And Gog is mentioned in verse 7. So let's read it. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king, namely Christ, shall be higher than Agag. Now you will all be aware, of course, that the Septuagint renders that Gog. Agag, king of the Amalekites type of Gog in the word of God so it's quite rightly rendered by the Septuagint Gog so his king shall be higher than Gog and his kingdom shall be exalted Ael brought him forth out of Egypt he hath as it were the strength of a unicorn he shall eat up the nations his enemies and shall break their bones just like lions do and pierce them through with his arrows look at the language of verse 9 he couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, cursed is he that curseth thee. A principle that the nations don't understand today, 
but they will understand tomorrow. Because those who endeavour to lay their hand upon Israel in the day of Armageddon are going to feel the divine curse. So when Jacob gives this prophecy back here in Genesis 48, he's actually looking far off, brothers and sisters, into the future from his time, but not very far off from our time. Is it? It's not very far off. And this passage is going to be made real. And you are the ones who will make it real. If you're there. If like Judah, God has been effective in your life. You'll be there. Judah's going to be there. And he's going to see this prophecy fulfilled. And you and I hope to be involved in it. And we're going to see a magnificent son of Judah in that day. A man who never needed reformation. Because he was always obedient to his father. He never despised his heritage. He knew why he was born. And he made sure he lived the way that he was required to live because he was born the son of God and he comes into view in verse 10 in a very real way Genesis 49 and verse 10 the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the peoples be. So let's just deal with that last phrase first. It should be rendered, unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. That's how it ought to be rendered. That word gathering there is the Hebrew word yikara. It means obedience. And the RV and others translate it that way. He is going to get the obedience of the nations. And he'll do that through the judgments that we've just read about in verse 9. And they're all going to bow down before him. Just like Philippians 2 says, they'll all come and bow down before him. And he will be the ruler, the only ruler on earth, apart from those who rule together with him. We read in verse 10, the scepter. Now the scepter, of course, speaks of authority. And so authority in those days was symbolised by a rod or, or by a scepter. Even today, of course, in parliaments, they bring in the, you know, the black rod and lay it before the parliament when it's in operation. So they still use a similar symbology for authority. But, of course, the reason that the scepter is given to Judah is because of his qualities. And the reason that it will be taken up by Christ on behalf of Judah is because of his qualities. And those are the qualities that we've seen in the conversion of Judah and even greater in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Now this word lawgiver should actually be rendered the commander's staff or the ruler's staff. As I said, Jacob had a staff upon which he was leaning when he worshipped at the end of chapter 47. Well, this is a staff of authority. Remember what? Judah did with his staff. Can you recall what he did with his staff? He gave it to someone he thought was a harlot. In Genesis 38, he gave his staff away. Now the staff of Judah is between the knees of Jesus Christ because of Judah's conversion. That's the principle put between the knees of Jesus Christ. And that's what it means when it says from between his feet. Because if the, if the king is sitting on a throne and he has the staff with the scepter at the top which represents his authority, he has it between his knees and he's holding the bottom of the staff firmly between his feet. In other words, it governs everything. It governs his walk. These are the principles of divine authority. They govern everything about this man. And it's going to govern everything about the nations that he rules. Everybody will be brought into harmony with the divine authority established in Christ. That's what verse 10 of Genesis 49 is telling us. But then it says this, Until Shiloh come. 
Now, Brother Thomas correctly points out that the words in the Hebrew rendered with the one word, until, are actually ad ki. Simply means for that or because. And that's how Brother Thomas renders. He says, because Shiloh shall come. Not about until he come. But these things are going to happen because he will come. And he's about to come. And we have to have that absolute conviction, brothers and sisters and young people, that all the signs that God is giving us are indicative that that passage is about to be fulfilled. He is about to come. And when he does come, divine authority will be established in the earth. And unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. What a wonderful prophecy that is. So where is this authority going to be established, do you think? I want you to come to Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2. And we're going to read from verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith Yahweh, and many nations shall be joined to Yahweh. By the way, that word there, joined, is lavar. It's the root of Levi. Go on to read. And shall be my people. By the way, that's the language that's drawn from Genesis chapter 17. God changed the name of Abraham. Said, I will make thee a father of a multitude of nations. And those who come into Abraham, into Christ, through, uh, into uh, Abraham through Christ, he says... I will be their God and they shall be my people. Whenever you read that phrase, you go straight back to Genesis 17 because that's its roots. He says, I will make them my people. It says in verse 11, And I will dwell in the midst of thee and thou shalt know that Yahweh of armies has sent me unto thee and Yahweh shall inherit who? Judah. His portion. Yahweh shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before Yahweh, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. That's the time when this authority is established, and that's the place <laughs> where it's established. You know that the holy oblation is composed largely of the territory of ancient <coughs> Judah. So when God sets aside in the land the place where the house of prayer for all nations is established, it's right in the heart of the territory of Judah. And the holy oblation covers the territory of Judah. That's why it says in verse 12, Yahweh shall inherit Judah. So Judah as a tribe has to be shuffled a bit further north, don't they? They're the first tribe to the north, but they have to be shuffled to the north because Yahweh's taken their territory. Now that's telling you something, doesn't it? It's telling you something. Not only about the prophecy of Jacob, it's telling you something about Judah himself. That the great conversion that we saw this morning leading to marvellous things, absolutely marvellous things. But there's something even, in a sense, even more marvellous than that about what's happening to you and me today. So come back to Genesis 49. And we come to verse 11. Now remember we're talking about Shiloh. Now you know that Shiloh means... What? Peace. Tranquility. Rest. So here's the one that's going to bring the earth. Rest. Peace. Tranquility. 
Because Isaiah 9, verse 6, talks about him, doesn't it? Prince of Peace, amongst other titles. But how is that work affected today? How is it affected in people who are going to share his authority with him? Well, verse 11 strongly suggested. Verse 11 says, Binding his foal under the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So what does it mean, binding his foal unto the vine? Well, the word foal here, a year, means the young male ass. Now, normally in the Old Testament, the word for the male ass is kamor. And kamor, the male ass, is a symbol for Israel. But this is a young ass, a young male ass, just broken to a load. And, of course, it's a prophecy that out of Jacob and his family and his twelve sons would grow the nation of Israel and they would be brought under a load, namely the law of Moses, when God brought them finally out of Egypt. And they would be symbolised by an ass. But because they're young, they're fledgling here in the time of Jacob, and he's in Egypt, he's a small family, so to speak, he's described as a young male ass, still a symbol of Israel, but at a very early stage of its development. This is the far east era in the scheme of things. So what does it say about this binding of this young male ass? Well, it's bound unto the vine. Now, you know what the vine represents. Some of you will have Psalm 80, verses 8 to 11, in the margin of your Bibles. Psalm 80 says that Yahweh brought a vine out of Egypt. It's the nation of Israel. And he planted them in the land of Canaan. He planted that vine in the land of Canaan. So this young male ass is bound to the vine of Israel. It's all about the development of Israel in the land. Well, let's read on. And his ass is colt unto the choice vine. Ass is colt. Ben Athown. The son of the female ass. Now the female ass, in the divine scheme of things, represents the multitude of Israel. So we've got the son of the multitude of Israel. Now where is this beast bound? Well, he's bound to the choice vine. And this word choice here is Sorek. You've heard of the valley of Sorek. Sorek, of course, produced the very best purple grapes, the richest variety that produced the very best wine. Represents here the true Israel of God. So this, this ass's cult is bound to the true Israel of God. You know who that's speaking about, brothers and sisters? you and me. The Gentiles who are brought into the faith. Do you know how we know that? Well, because this is the passage that Christ used to choose an ass's colt. When on the tenth of Abi he rode into Jerusalem. Yeah. He knew which of the two animals he was going to ride. But if all you had was Zechariah 9 verse 9... And even Matthew 21 verse 7, you wouldn't know. Would you? You wouldn't know. So join me in Zechariah 9 verse 9 on the way to Matthew 21. Zechariah 9 and verse 9, well-known prophecy. chapter of Zechariah and at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, 
or at least saving himself, as it's better rendered, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal, and that word is Ben, the son of an ass. Yep, so here he is, that word there, ass at the end of verse, uh, of verse 9, happens to be a thound. <coughs> A foul. That's the word back in Genesis 49. Verse 11. So there's two animals here. Which one was Christ going to ride? Well, we're not told. Now I'm sure there's some young men in this audience who would say, look, bring along two horses and I'll ride them at the same time. Yeah, they might get split legs. But anyway, it's very hard to ride two animals at the same time, isn't it? So which one was he going to choose? Well, that doesn't tell you. But what it does tell you is this. Just read on. Verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. This is talking about a very serious conflict. And then what's he going to do? And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, the nations. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. It's actually being drawn from Genesis 49. So come to Matthew 21, verse 7. Jesus sends his disciples, two of them, and get two animals from Bethany. He's located in Bethphage and sends them to Bethany. Get two animals. And we read about this in verse 7 of Matthew 21. And they brought the ass and the colt and put on them, so both of the animals had clothing put on them, put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. Now the word them and the word thereon are both plural in the Greek. Which one? Now Matthew's writing for Jews. Isn't he? He's writing for Jews primarily. He does not indicate which one. Sounds like the Lord's writing two. But when you come to Mark and Luke and John, they only mention the cult. The cult, the foal of an ass. And Jesus knew perfectly well he was going to ride the coal, the foal of an ass. How do you know it? Genesis 49 and verse 11. Because the time had come for Israel to be pushed aside, as Paul talk, tells us in Romans 11, for the time being, pushed aside, that the gospel might go to the Gentiles. And Mark beautifully, wonderfully demonstrates that process. I want you to come to Mark chapter 11. <coughs> we have here the enacted parable of the last week of the life of the Lord. And in this enacted parable, we see the setting aside of natural Israel living under law, lost inside the house, and the gospel going to the Gentiles. <coughs> The passing by of the ass of Israel and the riding and control of many from the Gentiles, represented by the ass's colt, the unbroken colt, that no man has written before. Law could not control them, but the time has come for Christ to introduce them before he goes to the cross. And it all starts, of course, in chapter 10, <coughs> verse 46. In Mark 10, 46, we read that he came to Jericho, the city of palm trees, and the palm tree is the symbol for the nations, isn't it? We know that from many places. Exodus 15, 27, when Israel came to Elam, the place of the mighty ones, what did they encounter there? Twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. It was a vision of the kingdom. Israel. The twelve worlds providing sustenance for the seventy palm trees of the nations. Vision of things to come. So he comes to the city of palm trees. 
And then he finds a blind man called Bartimaeus, the son of pollution. And his name is spelled out twice. Bartimaeus, that would be sufficient, wouldn't it? Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus. The son of Timaeus, twice. Representing the Gentiles. Cut off. Two. Division. Cut off from the things of God. So where happens to be Bartimaeus? Well, he's by the highway side. Yeah. And those who refuse the invitation of Christ. You know what he said about them in Matthew 22? Forget them for the time being. You go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Go and preach to the Gentiles. And here's a blind man he can't see, but he knows that this one is the son of David. He comes from Judah. And he cries out to him. And his eyes are open and he follows Jesus in the way in verse 52. And that way just happened to be the way of the cross. It's where we are. And then he comes in chapter 11 of Mark to two towns. And there are three trees in Mark 11 and verse 1. Obviously, this is the Mount of Olives. So you've got the olive tree. You know what the olive tree represents in Scripture, don't you? Paul tells us. Zechariah 4 tells us. In chapter 11 of Romans, Paul says that you, the Gentiles, were taken from the wild olive and you were grafted into the, the olive of Israel, the olive tree of Israel. Its branches were cut off, taken off, and you were grafted into it. In Zechariah 4, you've got two olive trees feeding a lampstand in the kingdom age. Jew and Gentile. So the olive does service for Jew and Gentile. So what town does Christ come to first? Well, to Bethphage. It says that there, doesn't it? Verse 1. And Bethphage happens to mean the house of figs. Well, there's the other tree. The fig tree, the symbol of Israel. And that's what Christ did. He came to Israel first. But they rejected him. So it's from Bethphage, the house of figs, symbolising Israel, that he sends to the town over the way called Bethany, which just happens to mean the house of date palms. Palm tree being the symbol of the nations to the Jew first and then to the Gentile and everything that happens in this chapter from now on to verse 23 is all about the introduction of the Gentiles into the covenants of promise through the promises made to Abraham it's all about that there's hardly a phrase that's not pregnant with meaning I want to show you just a few we haven't got time to do the whole lot just a few so come down with me to verse 2 of Mark 11. He said to them, Go your way to the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, there will be an immediate response. You shall find a colt tied. So here's the unbroken foal of an ass. This is the, this is the foal of the female ass. This is the potential multitude of Israel. Potential members of the Ecclesia through the Abrahamic covenant. This is the red cord people. The hope of Israel people. These are the ones that are represented by this unbroken colt. So where are they? Well we're told in verse 4 that they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without yeah they're outside the house. But they're not free because they're locked up. They're tied. They're by the door without. But where is this place? Read on in verse 4. In a place where two ways met. Yeah. The way of Jew and the way of Gentile. And those who are tied outside the house, these Gentiles, are going to end up in going to end up in the house. And when you come down, and it says in verse 8 that they screwed branches of trees in the way, you have to ask yourself, well, what branches? What type of branches were they? And John 12, verse 13 says they were palm branches. 
like the ones that the multitude of Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 have in their hands. Yeah. The redeemed. Palm branches in their hands. Because they come from all nations. I will make thee a father of a multitude of nations. And then it says in verse 9, And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Save now in the name of the highest. And Jesus, of course, goes into the temple. He inspects it. He finds it unacceptable. And he goes out to where? To Bethany. The house of date palms. You know where Jesus left to go to his father from? And to whence he will return? You're told it in Luke chapter 24. Bethany. He left to go to God from Bethany. And you see, his understanding of these things came from places like Genesis 49. So very quickly, let's finish off Genesis 49. That's all we can afford to say on Mark chapter 11. goes on to say in verse 12, well we didn't get to comment on, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes and those of you who want to follow up on that and get the notes and it's, it's there for you if you wish. But of course it's actually talking about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact the RSV translates it, he washes. And it's actually talking about two phases of Christ's mission. The saving of himself, as it were, Zechariah 9, verse 9, redeemed out of death, receiving a change of garments as the guarantee of the salvation of those who are in him. And the second phase, the future work, stains his garments with the blood of Israel's enemies, referred to in Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 6, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. But then it says this in verse 12, His eyes shall be red with wine, now, this is not talking about drunkenness. This is, the, this is the stimulation of wine. And you read of that in places like Zechariah 9 and verse 15. When it talks about Israel, you being used as a weapon against Yahweh's enemies in Europe, under the work of Elijah, it talks about them being stimulated by wine. And of course, the wine here is the wine of pure doctrine. And that's why you read in verse 12, his eyes, I, the A-N, is the symbol of spirituality, spiritual intelligence. His eyes shall be red with wine, stimulated by pure doctrine. And his teeth, weapons, what the teeth represent, places like Proverbs 30, weapons, his teeth, white with milk. Milk, of course, we know is used of the purity of the simple doctrines of the truth, the, the milk of the word. And so the motivation behind the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and those who are with him in that day will be the purity of the truth. So let's conclude this session, brothers and sisters and young people, in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 4 John having seen this very long scroll written on both sides sealed with seven seals weeps says in verse 4 it's all about the unfolding of the history at which of course we find ourselves near the end it says in verse 4 I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll neither to look thereon and one of the elders who represents of course the saints in their priestly role in the kingdom one of the elders said unto me 
Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. But what kind of lion is this? What type of character did this lion have? Verse 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne, this is the throne of David, and of the four living creatures, the cherubim, in the midst of the elders, the twenty-four elders, the saints in their priestly role, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, literally, as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. The line of the tribe of Judah, brothers and sisters, is the man of altruism, laid down his life. But you and I might be there with Judah and his brethren and their father Jacob and Abraham and Isaac and all the faith.